Please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome back. On to stories from the insolvency space. CNBC TV 18 has accessed a forensic audit report on Benani Cement by Mumbai-based chartered accounting firm Hari Bhakti and Company. Now, the report flags off transactions that it calls, and I quote, potentially suspect. These transactions were made between July 1st, 2015 to the 30th of November, 2017. The report also, in fact, flags suspected related party transactions. It says that Benani Cement is yet to recover 487 crore rupees from SSPL against certain cement sales. Among other key observations, Haribhakti has highlighted an inter-corporate deposit of 1,148 crore rupees to parent company Benani Industries. We, in fact, spoke to Dalmia Bharat and Ultratech, the two participants in the bidding process of Benani Cement, while Dalmia Bharat's group CEO Mahindra Singhi said that it found suspicious transactions during the due diligence process, uh, Ultratech CEO said that the sale process of Birani Cement was opaque and unfair and was an unfair exercise and that the company was allowed very limited due diligence time period. Listen in. We have already been declared a successful bidder. Uh, our resolution plan has already been filed in NCLT. We could understand that there, there were suspicious uh, transactions and we could understand that there are certain receivables which will not come to us. Binani Cement might have thought that let us take the whole process uh, out of it so that this uh, investigation doesn't go up. And that's why they might have collided with the uh, Ultratech or uh, someone. NCLT uh, hearing is tomorrow. And maybe in one more hearing, uh, this uh, conclusion can take place. At no stage of the proceedings has RP ever shared with us any such findings pertaining to any fraudulent transactions which they might have discovered. Mm. RP is managing the company now for whatever last seven, eight months. Mm. Maybe they were aware of it, but certainly it was not put out to in the knowledge of resolution applicants and certainly not in our knowledge. We cannot comment about other resolution applicants. Do you think uh, that uh, the RP was not cooperating with a particular bidder and had vested interest in getting another bidder? I mean, what, I what is your I point not, of contention? I have, I have not made that, so let me explain to you. In this case, again, we got the best competition law experts to talk to the RP and to their advisors that there would be no issue around getting CCI approvals. We understand, again, we have been requesting, please share with us what has been the basis on which you decided that we are not H1. And not having got any response from the RP to this very legitimate request, we knocked at the door of NCLT. Terminating the entire insolvency case proceeding against a company and paying off the lenders and buying a company. Is that a disregard to IBC law? It is not Ultratech which is trying to take them out of IBC. But you're backing Benani. Please understand. Doing this. Please understand. Hmm. So let's understand when you talk about, on the one hand, we talk about law. On the other hand, we mix parties, hmm. you know, at our whim and fancy. Hmm. And that's the precisely the reason why there is so much of confusion. Well, in fact, staying with Benani Cement, Ultratech's offer to help Benani Cement pay off its debt in a manner that bypasses the formal bankruptcy process has raised some eyebrows in the government. CNBC TV 18, Sapna Das, who has been speaking to the government officials, joins in now with the details. Sapna, what are your sources telling you? Is there a chance that we may see the government tweaking the IBC altogether? Well, the sense from the top quarters in the government uh, circles is the fact that there's a bit of a disquiet on the way uh, the Ultratech, Ultratech Cements uh, bid came in. Uh, not that the government is ever going to talk about any specifics uh, or any specific deal as such. Uh, they always maintain an arm's length as far as the developments are concerned. But from a broad policy perspective, uh, possibly this uh, event raises a serious question on the sanctity of the IBC process, the insolvency and the bankruptcy code process. So that's one concern. Uh, the second, of course, in terms of, uh, you know, if fresh bits keep coming, then what happens to the timelines uh, of the resolution process? Does it keep getting uh, pushed forward? Uh, quite likely. Uh, the third aspect, of course, uh, specifically in terms of the Ultratech uh, bid, that, you know, there, was a, there appears to be a private arrangement uh, wherein the uh, defaulting promoter, Binani, agreed to, you know, kind of uh, 
uh, you know, uh, take this bid from Ultratech Cements. Uh, now, what really ha will happen on this front is, of course, for the NCLT to decide, uh, you know, the call actually will be taken over there. Uh, but from a government perspective, probably uh, they're not too happy with the way things have happened, despite the fact that uh, there is a higher price for the bid and the economic value, the economic rationale on that probably would be very clear. Now, will the government uh, come out with any clarification on a broad perspective, uh, on a broad policy perspective level? Uh, we really don't know because what we understand as of now is that separately probably uh, some changes are being looked at uh, in, the on, in, in the insolvency in the bankruptcy code. Now, what route the government will adopt on that front? Will it be through the rule modification or will it be through amendments? And if at all a call is taken on that, that's still an open-ended question as of now. Okay, fair enough. Uh, we will know in the days to come. Sapna, thanks for joining in with that. And from one complicated insolvency deal to another, companies like New Metal and ArcelorMittal may get another chance to bid for the assets of SR Steel. CNBC TV Jin Ritu Singh, who has been tracking this, is here with the details. So, Ritu, what exactly has changed? Why are the lenders of SR Steel going on for a fresh round of bidding? And are the parameters going to change this time around? Well, new day, new twist in the SR Steel case. The Committee of Creditors in its meeting held today has disqualified both New Metal and Arcelor Mittal bids and also voted in favor of inviting a fresh round of bidding for SR Steel. Just as we told you earlier in the day, now the COC has also decided to invite bids from only those players that had submitted expressions of interest to acquire SR Steel in the first round of bidding. So not only Arcelor Mittal and New Metal, but also all the other players, including including Vedanta, Tata Steel, Sale, Nippon Steel, all of them will also get a chance to again place their bids for SR Steel. The resolution professional, we understand, will also soon set a firm date for the submission of these bids because remember, the 270-day uh, period for resolution for SR Steel is set to expire by the end of April, before which bankers have the time to uh, finish this process again. But in the meantime, New Metal earlier today had moved NCLT to reinforce its eligibility for submitting a resolution plan for SR Steel, claiming that full facts of the case were not really considered by the resolution professional at the time of disqualifying them. Uh, the NCLT, that is the Ahmedabad court, has ruled uh, that the decision taken by the creditors will have to take into cognizance the final order by NCLT in this new metal case. But if you ask me, the order is not really very significant anymore, given that uh, new metal, just like the other players, will also get a chance to rebid for SR Steel. To the latest in the Aadhaar debate, a five-judge constitution bench headed by Chief Justice Deepak Mishra is hearing a clutch of pleas challenging the constitutional validity of the Aadhaar. Now, kicking off his defense of Aadhaar and data security in the Apex Court, the Attorney General said, and I quote now, all doubts and fears will be clarified. We'll show a four-minute video. We'll show a video clip of the data center. The data center is surrounded by walls that are 13 feet high and 5 feet in thickness. We have various safety precautions. Uh, let's in fact bring in Ashmit Kumar, who was in the courtroom today. Ashmit, quite a colorful defense there very clearly. What transpired in, in the court today? Right, so an interesting choice of words, an interesting choice of arguments being used by the Attorney General of India uh, to mount his defense as far as the Aadhaar regime is concerned. Keep in mind that today is day one in this case where the government is mounting its defense uh, as far as the use of uh, and the application of Aadhaar is concerned. Now mind you that uh, Mr. K. K. Venugopal began his arguments by referring to the security of these data centers, uh, saying and in fact making a reference to the walls around these data centers, arguing that the walls are 13 feet high and 5 feet wide. And this interestingly wasn't said in jest, it was said in all seriousness uh, to the bench headed by none other than the Chief Justice of India. That's not all. He went on to build on his arguments by pointing out that the architecture of the act is such that it does not, uh, that due regard has been given to privacy. He also went on to argue that right to life with dignity as a shorter under the Indian constitution means access to uh, food, shelter, education, employment, and that Aadhaar is critical in providing these amenities uh, to the people of the country. Now, what's interesting is that the Apex Court made its own fair share of observations as far as these arguments are concerned. The Apex Court observed that right to privacy is as much a part of Article 21 as is the right to life with dignity. The Apex Court also went on to observe that just the mere act of enrolling with Aadhaar 
It does not mean that one signs away uh, the right over one's data and that, that one does not surrender that data. And also the Supreme Court observing that there are reports emerging that the very amenities that the government seems keen on providing, well, those amenities are being denied uh, to the people under the Aadhaar regime. So this was a quick wrap of day one of the government's arguments. Uh, we understand that the Attorney General will continue uh, his defense of Aadhaar tomorrow before the Apex Court. Back to you. Okayness of frauds in India's public sector banks is only getting bigger after PNB. It's now SPR that's been cheated by one of its borrowed borrowers. We learn from sources that the country's largest lender, State Bank of India, has filed a complaint with the CBI against Chennai-based firm Kanish Gold Private Limited for siphoning off funds worth over 800 crore rupees. A lender's consortium of 14 banks led by SPR had extended credit to Kanish Gold, and SPR's complaint to CBI essentially alleges possible siphoning of funds anomalies in sales and stocks. So that's a developing story that we will be tracking. Of course, keep a watch on SBI stock tomorrow morning. Now, last night, we reported on a parliamentary panel's report expressing serious concerns over Modi government's flagship urban development scheme. Responding to that very report, the Minister for Urban Development, Hardeep Singh Puri, spoke to CNBC TV 18. He did admit that budget allocation is not enough. Here's an excerpt of that exclusive conversation. My problem with the uh, flagship programs is not the slow rate of implementation. I think the flagship programs are roaring. My, my issue with, with them is to find the money uh, to, to meet the very ambitious targets. Uh, you know, um, I would uh, encourage uh, people to look at figures a little more um, scientifically. My problem here is not slow implementation. My problem here is money. We were getting 6,000 crores in the budget uh, last year. Uh, this, that, that has been raised to 6,500 crores under Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana. That is not sufficient to provide the uh, funds required under the four verticals. So if you are carrying out a scheme on this scale, money is what is required. The parliament, uh, parliamentary committee did say that it is a matter of con serious concern that the flagship programs of the government, which are widely publicized, have actually been sidelined in the budget. So, so this 63,000 crore rupees that you mentioned, sir, which NHP and Hotco are supposed to raise, are you confident you'll be able to raise it? With due respect to any, any suggestion that the budget doesn't provide the money, budget has to provide funds for a large number of schemes. As long as I have money to implement the flagship uh, program, I'm satisfied. And now I can tell you, I'm not just satisfied. These flagship schemes are roaring. I mean, I have, I'm having difficulty, not difficulty, I'm putting it lightly. I have to keep pace with the demand which is generated. So whenever any uh, chief minister comes to me, um, I had one yesterday. They're all saying, all right, we need money for this, we need money for that. Yes, I'm totally confident that we have the ability to raise money through extra budgetary uh, sources, uh, if necessary, from the market. We haven't got to that step yet, but uh, I am deeply committed to meeting the targets under the flagship uh, programs, and I'm happy to discuss those ta targets with you. Look, you don't spend, you don't incur capital expenditure till it's ready to be spent. I mean, you, I'm not going to release money unless the project, project for which it is utilized is doing that. And I'm just telling you, on the smart city side, on other uh, capital expenditure, you have to be careful. So now if you look at what is being budgeted and what we are supplying, that, that is what is important. That's the Urban Development Minister's spirited defense on the serious allegations that have been levied. Uh, but with that, we're completely out of time on this edition of India Business Hour Plus. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good night.